It doesn't matter how big you think your dream is. It doesn't matter how big you think your vision is. God says, it's nothing for me. God says, I can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask with this. Faith and prayer. Okay, faith and prayer. Faith is probably my favorite topic because the Bible says that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith and then the Bible says it is faith that overcomes the world. Now, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 1 John verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Our faith overcomes the world. By faith, the Bible says God created everything that you can see. Okay? The Bible says, and God said, let there be, and there was. All right? So, why is faith important? Number one, God gave it to us so that we can overcome any and everything that we face. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, all those spiritual blessings, that's great up there, but I need them in the natural realm. Faith creates that bridge from the spirit realm into the natural realm. It's my ability to believe the word of God and act on what I believe. That's a simple definition of faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, chap Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But notice, without faith, you cannot please God. Yes, we should live a consecrated life. Yes, we should live a holy life. Yes, we should live a life that's pleasing to God. But a life that's pleasing to God is a faith life. It is a faith that can see the unseen. One man said this, we've been given a sixth sense. I believe sixth sense. I believe it was John Osteen that wrote the book, Faith, the Sixth Sense. In other words, I can see what my natural eyes cannot see. I see myself with the car that I need. I see myself with the promotion. I see myself with that godly spouse. I see my children serving God. I see myself with a better car. I see myself with a better house. I see it with the eye of my faith when everything in the natural contradicts what I'm believing. That's what faith is. Faith believes what the word of God says, regardless of the circumstances. Abraham believed God, regardless of how he looked, Regardless of the fact that Sarah had been barren, he believed God. And because he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness, according to Romans chapter 4. Faith is so important because when the doctor says it's terminal, faith says, by Jesus Christ, I'm healed. Faith says he's the Lord my God who heals me and he takes sickness away from the midst. Faith is what happens when you don't have any money, the bill is due, but you have peace because you know my God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Faith causes the impossible to become possible. You cannot get saved without faith. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and I could quote it to you, but I want to read it to you. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and out of yourselves it is the gift of God. But notice, you are saved, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's through faith. How many of you guys, you saw Jesus die on the cross? Did anybody see him? Was anybody there at the crucifixion? Did you see the tomb? Did you see the angel roll away the stone? Have you seen the Lamb's Book of Life? No. None of us have seen the Lamb's Book of Life. None of us have seen Jesus or saw him when he walked on the earth. Yet we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. We believe that he was in hell for three days. We believe that God raised him from the dead. And we believe that he's seated at the right hand of God. We believe that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you can believe 
that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's raised from the dead, you can believe that he'll meet your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can believe that you are divinely protected. You can't see the angels, but yet you know you're divinely protected. Right? Remember the story of Elisha? They were surrounded by the enemy, by the king's army, and his servant was tripping. And then Elisha said, Lord, open up his eyes. See, faith allows you to see into the unseen realm, like I said earlier. That's how important faith is. I like something Kenneth Hagin said. He said, my faith is giving substance to what I'm hoping for because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So my faith is giving substance to what I'm hoping for. I hope to be healed. I'm hoping for a better job. I'm hoping for that better car. But faith says I have it now. And when I believe it by faith, it's giving substance. It's bringing what I want from a non-tangible state into tangibility. Until I can feel it, taste it, touch it, see it, smell it. That's what faith is. Jerry Savelle says, God is always working behind the scenes. You can't see him working, but all you got to do is keep believing. And that's what Jesus said to Jairus in Mark chapter 5. Remember the story? How the woman with the issue of blood, she heard of Jesus, and when she heard of Jesus, she went out to the press and touched the hem of his garment, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. So after she touched him, virtue came out of Jesus, he said, who touched me? And then she came, made herself aware or made herself known to Jesus. She gave her testimony and they said, hey, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the master any longer? And Jesus said, fear not, only believe. Faith calleth those things which be not as though they were. The Bible says that when Jesus got to Jairus' house, he said, why are you making all this noise? The damsel is only sleeping. I'm just going to wake her up. She's sleeping. He never said she's dead. He said she's asleep. Jesus called those things which be not as though they were, and Jesus believed in the power of his words. Because Jairus said, if you will lay your hands on my daughter, she'll be whole. She'll be raised up. So Jairus said what he was going to, what he believed, and Jesus said, I'll do that. And when he did it, he laid his hands on her. She was raised up. Jairus believed in his words. And that's how faith is released. Faith is released by words and by actions. Faith is released by words and actions. The woman in Mark chapter 5, she said, if I can just touch his clothes, He'll be made whole, or rather, let me put it differently. If I can just touch his clothes, I will be made whole. And what did she do? She got up and she went to where he was. Now, she could have sat there all day and said, if I touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. If I touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. If I touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. And she'd have died. Possibly. You have to act on what you believe. The Bible says in James chapter 2, We'll start with verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you see how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only or you could say corresponding action. In Weymouth's trans, trans, uh, translation, it says, Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I remember the story of Kenneth Copeland when he was believing God for his first airplane. He went and bought instruments that go on an airplane. He bought what it took to clean the airplane. He had the instruments and what it took to clean the airplane, and he had it in the back of his car. And when people said, why do you have airplane instruments in the back of his car? He said, because I believe that I have an airplane. So what he was doing was he was making his actions line up with what he believed. 
Jerry Savelle was believing God for an airplane. And the spirit of God said to him, do you believe that you received the airplane? This is back in the 70s. He said, Lord, I believe. He said, well, if you believe you have an airplane, set your schedule as if you had one. So what he did was he would set the schedule up so to the point where he would get to a certain place. And if where he was preaching, if it wasn't a major city, he would get to the major city and drive to the city where he was having the meeting. So he said he did that for a long period of time. He said after about a year or so of doing that, the spirit of God asked him, do you really believe that that you re that you received the airplane? And he said, now, Father, you see that I just booked my schedule like I have an airplane. And then God said, where are you going to have the, the airplane when you get it? Don't you got to put it in a hangar? So when he sat before the man who owned the hangar, the man said, what kind of airplane do you have? And Jerry Savell said, a good one. He said, OK, I understand it's a good airplane, but what kind is it? He said, I don't know. He said, my father's getting it for me. And so the guy said, well, look, man, until you have an airplane in your possession, you cannot get the hangar. He said, if I don't get the hangar, I can't get the airplane. And he said, do you want to stand before God and tell him that you kept the man of God from getting his airplane? And the man said, no, nah, I don't want that on my conscience. So then what he did was he gave Jerry Savelle a hangar, and Jerry Savelle said he then bought what it took to paint the airplane, to clean the airplane. He had the hangar. He had his stuff set up, his, his meeting set up as if he had an airplane. And he said it wasn't a matter of time until finally the airplane manifested. But he had to put corresponding actions to what he believed. So if you're believing God for clothes, why not have a space in your closet where the clothes are going to go? Or if you're believing God for a new car, why don't you find out how much the insurance is going to be on that new car you believe in God for? Or why don't you, you know, if you have take a picture or get something in the magazine and you touch it every day and say, I believe I receive, I have it by faith in Jesus' name. See, when you're believing God, see, faith happens in stages. Okay? You, 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 everybody starts off with the same measure of faith. And as you, are, as you are believing God and confessing the word of God and meditating the word of God and hearing the word of God, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I had to, I, during this time, I was listening to my faith tapes. Everybody say tapes, because I was still listening to tapes. I listened to my faith cassette tapes, right? I was listening to Pastor Gould's tapes. I was listening to Brother Copeland's tapes. I was listening to Keith Moore's tapes. I was listening to Kenneth Hagin's tapes. I was listening to Charles Capps' tapes. I was listening to Fred Price's tapes. Everything I get my hands on on faith. Kenneth Copeland says, I don't go a day without, without, uh, what, what's the word to use? Kenneth Copeland says, I don't go a day without building my faith. Every day I'm building my faith. He said, because faith is how I got here. Faith is how I live. And faith is going to be how I, how I succeed from here on out. He said, that's how important faith is. So it doesn't matter where you start. You just got to start. But I didn't start off by believing God for a car. I started by believing God for a T-shirt. I was 19, 20, hearing Pastor Gould teach on faith. And Pastor Gould said something like this. Pastor Goose said, start off by believing God for a pair of socks. And he said, when you believe in God for socks, once you get the socks, believe him for the pair of pants. And then believe him for the shirt. And then believe him for the whole outfit. Then believe him for the shoes. That's how you build your faith. You don't build your faith trying to overcome cancer. You start with the headache. You start with the toothache. You start with something small where your life is not on the line. You don't lose your house if you don't have the money. So I was believing God for the T-shirt. I believe that I received by faith, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next day, I came home for work, and there was a T-shirt laying on my bed. And I looked at it, and I said, wow, this stuff works. <laughs> my, my sister came in, and she said, I bought this T-shirt several weeks ago. And this was back in the day. See, now it was like the slim fit everything. Back in the day, it was the baggy. So you bought stuff two sizes too big. So my, t my, my, my daughter, my, my daughter, my sister, she bought this T-shirt that was two sizes too big. So she said, we did this shoot for some music group she was a part of. She said, I wore this shirt one time. And she said, it's too big. It's way too big for me. She said, but I thought about you. She said, so I took this T-shirt and I laid it on your bed. 
And I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> this stuff works. Let me tell you guys something. God answers prayer. And that takes, I, I guess that's a great intro into the prayer part. God answers prayer. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists. Now, you can tell me all day that you believe in God, but you really know you believe in God when you are praying and you believe that somebody that you can't see is going to answer your prayer. That's faith. That's faith in prayer. Now, the Bible says in Luke, yeah, we'll go Luke chapter 18, verse 1. We got the roll. Luke chapter 18. It says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So we are to live a life of prayer. We are to pray if you don't mind me saying this, we should be praying in the morning. We should be praying throughout the day. Now, I'm not saying you got to stop and get on your knees and stop what you're doing and praying. But throughout the day, Father, I just love you. I just praise you, Father God. Father, is there anything that, that you want to say to me? I just want you to know that I'm open to receive from you today whatever you want to say to me. Smith Wigglesworth, they said he wouldn't go 15 minutes without praying to God. If 15 minutes went by and you had people in the room, he said, excuse me for one second. Father, forgive me. And he would pray to God. 15 minutes would not go by without him talking to God. Now, I'm not saying you got to be that extreme. There was only one Smith Wigglesworth. But his passion for God was so strong that he didn't want to go 15 minutes without praying to God. See, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. But notice it says, praying always. We're to always pray. We're to always be in communication with God. The Bible talks about it, and Pastor Gould talked about it a few weeks ago, how Jesus got up way early in the morning before the sun came up. And he was interacting with the Father. And, and Jesus would go, and he would minister, and he would walk, and he would travel, and he would preach and lay hands. And then once he would dismiss the crowd, the Bible says he would go into the mountain and he would go and pray. Now, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with Yonggi Cho. Yonggi Cho used to be the pastor of the largest or one of the largest churches in America, in South Korea. I think at one time, I think right now, the church has around 700,000 members. But he talked about how the key to his church growth was prayer. He said when the ministry first got started, he would pray an average of five hours a day. And then as they started to grow on Friday nights, they will have all night prayer. Every Friday night, they will have all night prayer. And that, he said that was the key to the explosive growth. They understood that the ministry would have to be birthed in prayer. God doesn't want us in the dark about anything. If you read the life of David, the Bible says that David would always inquire of the Lord. He would inquire of the Lord. Do you want me to engage with the Philistines? Do you want me to do this? Should I go here? Should I do that? He was always talking to the Father because the Father always knew what was up the road. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16, the spirit of truth, he will show you things to come. The late Ken of Hagen, he talked about how the Spirit of God woke him up one morning and said, a recession is coming. And this is how you prepare for the recession. He said the Spirit of God told him how many people to lay off. The Spirit of God told him what outreaches to get away from. He said, because I didn't tell you to get involved in those outreaches in the first place. And then he told him how much money to save going into that recession. So Kenneth Hagin, what he did was they had to lay off a certain amount of people, but he said he helped those people get other jobs. He then got out of outreaches that God never told him to be a part of. And then thirdly, he started saving money to prepare for the recession so that when the recession hit, he was ready for it. And see, the spirit of God doesn't want us to be caught off by anything. At the same time, 
The Spirit of God also wants to tell you how to handle every area of your life. Now, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, he says, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things. In the Amplified, it says, I will show you things that are fenced in and hidden, things that you don't understand. The Spirit of God wants to show you what's going on with your children. The Spirit of God wants to show you what's going on with your spouse. The Spirit of God wants to show you what's going on on your job. Jesse Duplantis, he told his daughter when she was going out on a date, he said, now let me tell you something. I'm tight with God. And Jesse Duplantis told his daughter, the Spirit of God will tell me everything that you do on that date. And she said, oh, daddy, whatever, whatever, whatever. So she went out on a date. She didn't do anything wrong or nothing. But she went out on a date. She came home. And Jesse Duplantis said, I'm going to tell you what you did on your date. You went here. And then you went here. And then you went here. She said, daddy, that's not fair. He said, I told you, I'm tight with God. He said, God tells me everything. He said, he's not going to keep me in the dark about what goes on with my own daughter. So God wants to show you everything. He says, call unto me. I'll answer. You remember the scripture Pastor Guru read this morning in Psalm 91? The Bible says in Psalm 91, in verse 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. But notice, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. That's what prayer is. Prayer is in constant dialogue with God. Prayer is in constant conversation with God. Now, you don't have to be spooky and you ain't got to be crazy. And everybody know you talk to God all day, every day. But you know what God, you know what Jesus said? And I believe in Matthew chapter six or maybe five, he says, whatever is done is secret you will be rewarded openly. He said, don't be like the uh, Pharisees or whoever he said. They, they, they like to pray these long prayers and they want to be seen by men. He said, no, they have their reward. He said, you pray in secret. And what you pray in secret, you will be rewarded openly for it. So we want to make sure that we live a life of prayer. Now, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, Somebody said this to me, and I agree with him. He said, you, you don't really, put it differently. He said, you understand God better when you have children. He said, when you have children, it helps you to understand God better. Because my sons and my daughter, they've done stuff, and it's just like, what were you thinking? But I still love them. I still want to do things for them. I still want to see them be the best. I still want them to live a good life. Remember, the Bible says that the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. I believe it's Psalm 35, verse 27. Well, if the Lord takes pleasure in, in the prosperity of his servant, how much more his children? The Bible talks about how if he did not, if God did not spare his own son, will he not freely give us all things? Remember, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives. And he that seeketh finds. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What man is there of you? If his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Ask. Now, that sounds simple. But how many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, I'm just going to tell on myself in the past, you've gotten close to running out of money and you don't think about prayer, you think about a relative. Or you hear those payday loans commercial and you start thinking, well, shoot, I don't really need $1,500, but if I can, you know, right? I mean, just, just keeping it real. I'm not saying I did it, but the thought, just, just keeping it real, right? But, but what would happen if you would just go to the father? I, I, you know, if my, if my son was to say, uh, Dad, I, I want to go to Papa's house. And I said, why do you want to go? Well, I need, 
I would like uh, a Lego set. I'm gonna ask him for it. I would say, why wouldn't you ask me? I'm your father. I'm your dad. And he said, well, I don't know if you'll get it for me or not. Oh, man, what, for real? What have I done to make you feel like I wouldn't do anything for you? Now, I'm, I'm an earthly dad. How much more our Heavenly Father? I have to believe that a being I can't see is going to get money to me. It's going to pay a bill for me. It's going to cause a tumor to disappear. It's going to cause cancer to leave my body. I can't see this God but I know he's real. And the more you see God manifest in your life, the greater your faith. Because faith is a relationship with God. You can have the promises all day. I could promise you something all day long, but if you don't know me, you're going to question whether or not I can do it for you. But when you ask God, that's why you start small. You start small. And as, it's almost like, I put it differently. Anybody bench press? Okay, everyone bench press, my man. I'm sure everybody, most of y'all don't lift the weights in here, right? When you started lifting weights, you didn't start with 225 pounds. You started with the bar. You started with the bar because if you started with 225 pounds, you were going to be short a chest cavity because that, 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 uh, that bar was going to go straight through your chest. So you did something you could do. You did the bar. Then once you could do the bar, you did 10 pounds on each side, right? That's how it was with me. I had to start off with the bar when I was 12, 13 years old, the bar. Then it was 15 on each side, 25 on each side. Then when you put 45 pounds on each side, you thought you were somebody, <laughs> right? Because you, 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 now I'm warming up with that. I thought I was the man when I was 14. I was able to bench press with the 45s on each side. Now that's a warm up for me. Now I can do 225, 235, 240. When I was in college, I got up to 305. That was in college. <laughs> I, I'm trying to get back there, but now I'm right around 240 or so. Okay, but this is my point. You can get to a point in faith where it took you forever to get socks. But then you get to a point where socks is, I can get socks. I can believe God for socks. I can believe God for $25. I believe God for $100 now. And I can believe God for $300. Now I can believe God to walk in divine health. I used to have to believe God every time the headache came. Now the headaches don't come anymore. I'm going to tell a story about that. Did you know the Faith Unlimited broadcast airs every Sunday at 6.30 a.m. on WMYT My 12, Channel 55? For more information, visit MatthewChapmanMinistries.org and subscribe to Matthew Chapman Ministries on YouTube and all social media outlets for more faith-building content. We pray that you were moved by this message from Minister Matthew Chapman. If you were blessed by this word of God and want to be a blessing towards the ministry, you can visit MatthewChapmanMinistries.org or write us at P.O. Box 242-422, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. And make sure that you tune in next time for Faith Unlimited.